As you know, chess requires an ability to think ahead and to catalogue of famous winning moves, but the strategy is also very important, and in this series of videos I will cover two main ways to improve your thinking strategy for each move. First we shall look at why a perfect chess game could ever be played, not even by computers. Then we shall see how computers are actually programmed to play. And then we shall study the approach using combinatorics to help improve your offensive and defensive play. Don't worry, these aren't as scary as they sound. Stay tuned to find out how they work, and with practice, you too could be on your way to playing chess like a wizard. Did you know? In 2014's The Imitation Game, three of Alan Turing's co-breaking team members that broke the Enigma Code were chess grandmasters. Now, it may seem ludicrous, but a method for computers to exhaustively play every chess game possible hasn't yet been solved. Now, let's take a further look at why that is. If you have ever heard of Claude Shannon, you may have come across Shannon's number, and also both the upper and lower bounds, the maximum and minimum for the number of possible arrangements of chess pieces on a board. Shannon's number is a rough approximation of the total number of moves that can be made by each chess player for each turn throughout the entire game. Let's take a look at what Wizard says. Wizard is saying that there are about a thousand different ways of white and then black playing per turn. Notice that we can split a thousand into ten times ten times ten. We can use powers, which is when a number is multiplied by itself however many times. So we can see ten is multiplied by itself three times. So we can also write this as 10 to the power 3. To the power is when it's got this small number just above. An average game lasts around 40 turns. So to calculate the total moves per game, we have to calculate the number of moves per, per of these 40 terms. So we write out 10 cubed 40 times. And notice that just as it is above here, we've got a number multiplied by itself so many times. Here it is 40. So we can write 10 cubed to the power 40. If you know how to multiply our powers, this is easy, this is fine. However, if you don't, consider that there are 10 times 10 times 10 written out 40 times. By simple multiplication or even addition if you so wish we can see there are 120 lots of 10. And using powers again, this 120 lots of 10 is 10 multiplied by itself 120 times. So we can raise it 10 to the power of 120. This is also called Shannon's number, the number at different positions per game from the very first move. It's so hard to imagine a number this big. This is 10 with 120 zeros after it. So let's compare it to something we roughly can imagine. The number of atoms in the observable universe is 10 to the power of 80. That's 10 with 80 zeros after it. Atoms make up everything around us. So if you think of the number of atoms in every star, in every solar system, in every galaxy, that is still 10 to the power of 40 times less than the number of chess games which exist. Now, the number of atoms in the universe is still a massive number, so let's compare it to something so much smaller. The number of seconds which have passed since the Big Bang, since the beginning of time. There are about 14 billion years which have passed since this event, and it can be calculated to be this number here. 4.6 times 10 to the power 17. This is 46 with 16 zeros after it. And this is still so much less than the number of games of chess which can be played. So, thanks to Wizard, we have seen that calculating the total number of chess games isn't really possible. So, another way of thinking would be to just calculate all the possible combinations of moves per individual round, committing each of these to the computer memory with the ideal response to make per turn. However, is this really feasible? Let's calculate it. Now we go over to Hat and his gorgeous assistant. Suppose we only have one chess piece. 
then we can place it on any of the 64 squares on the board. So we place it um, here, say. The next piece can go on any of the remaining 63 squares. The third piece can go on any of the 62 which haven't already been taken up, and so on and so on until we have none left. So for each of the 64 squares that we can start with, we have another 63 ways of placing the second piece, and so on. Turns out we have to multiply this all the way down to 1 to give the number of combinations of placing all 64 pieces. It turns out there is actually a notation for this. We call it factorial. We use the exclamation mark to symbolise this. Any number which is factorial means that we can take that number and multiply it by every whole number less than it until you get to 1. Now, because we run out of pieces after we've used up 32 in a normal chess set, there are 32 empty squares left over. Pause the video and count them if you really want. Following the same idea above, we can treat these squares as placeable objects. We shall be using poker chips here to demonstrate this. There are 32 ways to place this first square. 31 for the next as the first empty space has been taken up, and so on. So there are 32 factorial combinations of placing our squares. However, we are only interested in the number of ways of placing our 32 chess pieces. So we must divide the number of ways of placing 64 chess pieces on all of the squares by the number of empty squares, 32 factorial. Then we can rewrite this fraction by expanding the numerator, the top, until you get to 32 factorial. And then we can see that we can cancel or divide both the numerator and the denominator at the bottom by 32 factorial to get 64 times 63 all the way down to times 33 or rather the number of ways of placing 32 unique pieces. However, are these pieces really unique? Let's take a look. Notice that each player has 8 pawns. It makes no difference to the game if we interchange these. There are eight factorial ways of changing these around because there are eight ways to place the first pawn and then seven for the next and so on until you have no pawns left. However, we have two players so we multiply a factorial by a factorial for the white and the black pieces. Notice from earlier on in the video that we have two lots of the same number multiplied by itself. And so we have a factorial raised to the power of 2, or rather a factorial squared. We can also use the same method for the two rooks and the two knights. But bishops are a bit different, because are they really unique? Well, no, because one bishop can only move across right squares and the other can only move across black squares. However, Notice that the amount of squares which one bishop can actually travel along is only half of the total amount of the board. And also notice that 2 is the same as 2 times 1, which is the same as 2 factorial. So we can group the number of ways of combining these two bishops with the same as interchanging the knights and the rooks. We can group it all together in one category. So notice that we have, for each player, 2 factorial knights times 2 factorial rooks times 2 factorial bishop combinations. And we square this because of the two players. So again, from earlier on, we have 2 factorial multiplied by itself 3 times. We have 2 factorial cubed. We square this for the two players and multiplying our powers, or by thinking logically like we did earlier, we have 2 factorial raised to the power of 6. 2 factorial is multiplied by itself a total of 6 times. However, these combinations actually allow impossible moves to occur. For example, we can have two kings placed next to each other, or even pawns starting on the back row. But these are a relatively small number of impossible moves compared to the total number which we are calculating here. And so, we find that a value of the number of positions on the board per turn is this fraction here. This gives us a lower bound, a minimum value of roughly 10 to the power of 43. Now, 
this is still a very large number, as we saw earlier on in the video. And it has been proven that an upper bound exists. We call it Hardy's estimate, which is 10 raised to the power 10 to the power 50, or rather 10 to the power 10 with 50 zeros after it. This is an immense upper bound, and so we don't even consider it because it is so large that we can't possibly calculate with this. Hence, a perfect chess game isn't really possible. Even a computer needs a strategy. One we could take inspiration from. Please look out for my next video, How to Play Chess Like a Wizard. How do computers play chess? Thank you very much for watching. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up below. And also, I look forward to hearing from you in the comments below. Did you know the Turk, a fake chess playing automation machine that was constructed in the late 1700s, defeated many challengers, including Napoleon Bonaparte and Benjamin Franklin. Intended to impress, it was also possible of performing the Knight's Tour, one of many famous chess problems studied by famous mathematicians like Euler and Gauss, and is still unsolved today.